Welcome, I'm Sven Schadek from Leipzig University and um, I'm presenting work that I did together with Manfred Hoste, also from Leipzig, and with Werner Kuich from Vienna. I will be talking about um, weighted omega context free languages and I will present mainly our logical characterization for this class, but I also shortly will talk about um, two other results that we have. For an overview, I have a small picture for you, so you know what finite automata are, and the quantitative extensions are called weighted automata, and then there is pushdown automata for context-free languages and Vichy automata for infinite words, and they are combinations called weighted pushdown automata, at least um, the grammar case is quite old, from Chomsky and Schützenberger, and you combine context-free um, automata and infinite words, then you have to read a paper by Cohn and Gold, which is also quite old and comparably recent. You get the combination of weighted automata and infinite words, and this, I guess, is recent because it wasn't clear how you calculate weights for infinite words. Here's um, one of the solutions. I will present you another solution and I will discuss this a little bit later. Now we want to talk about the combination of all three properties. So then you have a quantitative automaton for infinite words and we can model context-free um, properties of languages. Now the main goal of this paper is a logical characterization and I have a short slide for you what the state of the art for this language class is. So in 2004, Ishig and Kuish um, published a paper on the grammar case, so these are called omega algebraic systems. Then in 2017, there were two papers by Troste and Kuish and one also by Ishig, where they published the connection between automata and grammar and also about regular expressions. Now we want to talk about logical characterization and um, also for the unweighted case, we use something that we call simple automata. And for this last year, also at the FSD TCS actually, we um, <coughs> presented the Kreibach normal form for this language class and also weighted simple omega pushdown automata. And these are actually essential for our logical characterization. And this is why I will start talking about those. So um, I guess you have some picture in mind what a pushdown automaton is. So here we have an infinite input tape. You have a stack where you can put and push symbols and you have a finite, um, finitely many states. And for our simple automaton, which is some kind of a normal form for these automatas, we want to forbid to have epsilon transitions. So for every transition, we will read one symbol of the input, which is also called real-time automaton. Then um, normal pushdown automata will pop one symbol of the stack and replace it by a word. And instead, we will only allow three stack commands. We will pop one letter, we will push one, or we ignore the stack. We call this also internal transitions. And um, this makes it actually much better for our logical characterization for the proof um, to work. But it has, I guess you can use this um, normal form also for other proofs. So I find it quite interesting that I haven't found much of it in the literature. Um, <coughs> normal pushdown automata always in every transition um, react to the top of the stack symbol. We will just forbid this instead only if you pop a letter A, then you know that it was there before. And um, we will not have an initial stack symbol, instead we will start with an empty stack. This automata occurred, um, as far as we know, only once in a class hidden by, uh, hidden in a proof by Plas and Kurevich. And um, you can see that this one is also on nested words. We also use it in the combination with nested words. So here is an um, example automaton 
we have states. This one here is initial. This one is also Bücher accepting. So we will mainly talk about Bücher acceptance today. And then every transition reads a letter, either A or B. And these downward facing arrows means that we push a symbol. And upward facing arrows means that we pop, pop one. And these hash symbol means that we ignore the stack, um, the stack state altogether. So here we could, for example, read A and then read another A. And then we have only N on the stack. We would pop it here by reading B and read another B. Then you have A, A, B, B. And in total, you actually have A and B, N and omega many of those because you always return to the state S here. Okay. So this is the unweighted case. And now let's see what um, weighted languages are. Just a short reminder for those who don't work with them um, all the time. So if you consider a formal language, then it's just a subset of strings. And we can view it from another angle. Then you see that it's actually a function where you um, assign either true or false to your strings. And um, we want to generalize this. Don't take only Boolean values to true and false, but take a set A. Then you get the series, which assigns to strings some weight out of your set A. Or similar, similarly, you can take infinite words and assign weights to it. So now, uh, what, what weights can you use? What can you use for the set A? And there's different answers to this. Normally, I, I guess the most common answer is a use a semi-ring, and then you multiply along the, along the run, and you add up the weights of all runs. For infinite words, it's not so easy. Then you need complete semi-rings, because you need to handle infinite products and infinite sums. And um, we use a little bit more general approach than the complete semi-ring approach, which, which is called omega valuation monoids and um, this means that you take a monoid so here you have some set d with an addition and some neutral element to this addition and we need that this monoid is complete which means um, it can handle infinite sums so whenever there is an infinite sequence and we need to add it up then we assume that the monoid somehow um, can do this already and then we add some omega valuation function to it, which takes an infinite sequence of values and gives us back one value. So um, this <coughs> could, for example, take all the values and multiply them in a row. And then in this case, you will have the same as complete same rings. But what we can also do is these um, examples are um, are actually by Shatayan, Dorian, and Hensinger. You can take some real numbers with minus and plus infinity, and you take, can take the supremum as your addition, then you have minus infinity as the neutral element. And because this is idempotent, it's actually um, complete without any problem. And then you could take the limb average as the omega valuation function. This would mean that you have something like this. You take your infinite sequence of weights, this is the i here, and you calculate the average value of those, even though it's an infinite sequence. And what you can do as well, you can take lambda smaller than one, and then you calculate, or you take the function discounting for lambda, where you prioritize your values in your sequence and you say that the ones that are um, that are in the beginning of your sequence they are actually um, more important than the ones that are in the end of your or that are later in your sequence right there is no end of course um, lambda to the power of i <coughs> will be smaller and smaller when i increases and such that the values in the end will have less importance in our um, sum. And for this, 
Um, this you can use for rich, um, risk management, for example, because some error that occurs in the far future is not as important as one that occurs now. And I guess this is something that we do with um, nuclear plants, for example. We know they can explode, but hopefully not, not today, so it's not that bad. So let's see a small example. But first, um, the behavior of our automaton. We take a successful run of our automaton. So this one starts in an initial state and has this Büchi acceptance condition. So at least one of the Büchi accepting states is visited infinitely often along the run. And then we apply, we take for every transition that is used, has infinitely many, we take one weight. So this is given by the automaton definition. Then we have an infinite sequence of weights and we apply the omega valuation function to it. And then we add up all the weights of every successful run. And for every series that we, where we can find an automaton with this behavior, we call the series recognizable. Now, here's a small example. I'm sorry, it has to be small because we translate it later into logic and um, you see here, <coughs> there are only internal transitions, but it's a black box system and you can think of something context-free in here. But what I wanted to show you is here the weights will be used in a discounted uh, weight structure. So this means um, you have some system that gives you a regular income of two, maybe two dollar or two thousand euro or whatever, what you want. In some years you get nothing but the worst case here is this error that lets you break your system and then you have to buy a new one, right? So this means if the error occurs in the beginning, then it's bad because you haven't made enough money yet. But if it breaks in 5,000 years, for example, then it's not a big problem. So this is the idea of this discounting. And you cannot easily do it with semi rings. Now we have the following results. Um, we have a Nivar-like theorem. So Nivar did something similar for transducers, where he said that we can um, decompose transducers into two parts. One is for the structure of the input language, and one is for the output. And here we have something similar. It's a decomposition theorem, where we decompose our series S into an unweighted language L that has basically the structure of our language. And then we have something that is weighted, but only uses one state. So it's very, very easy. And this cares about the output. And um, <clears throat> yeah, I don't want to go into detail too much, but it also works in the other direction. But for context-free languages, we need to restricted to unambiguous languages L. Otherwise, our closing properties that we also proved for this theorem um, don't work in every case. Now, our second result is um, that we compared Büchi and Muller acceptance, and we found out that they're actually equivalent for our language class, which is nice because both occur in practice, and it's uh, good to know that we can translate one into the other. And the proof idea is a refinement of the standard construction where we have to make sure that we don't add new ambiguity. So um, there was one similar approach already in the weighted case, but we need to refine it even more to make it work in our case. Now, um, the rest of the talk, I want to talk about the logical characterization. And the idea of our logic comes from Lautemann, Schwentig, Therrien, who did something similar for context-free languages of finite words. And the idea here is already adapted to infinite words. So W is an infinite word. That means the positions in the word are actually the non natural numbers. And we call such a relation matching if it fulfills three properties. So the first is M has to be compatible with the smaller relation. So here, this is not allowed. 
each position has to belong to at most one pair in our relation. So again, here's the counterexample. And m has to be non-crossing. Okay, this is also not allowed. So in the end, you get something like this. And you can see, if you know what dip languages are, for example, here's a bracket open, here it's close, open, close. Or maybe you can see it as a protocol of our pushdown automaton, then you would push something here, and you would pop it here, you push something here and you pop it here. So this is the idea and maybe you could call it the essence of context-free languages and it's also put into this logic. So now let's see what this logic looks like. So um, in classical MSO this one is equivalent to regular languages. You will have something like first order and monadic second order variables, so these are set variables, and both will be used for positions in our word. And then we define our logic inductively by using those um, atoms and compounds. So we have at position x their symbol a. We can compare variables. One position is smaller than the other. You can see if a variable is part of a set variable, and you have these logical extensions. And now, of course, we extend it to um, accept context-free languages. And we do this by adding this variable mu. And mu is actually mon um, dyadic second order. So this means it's no longer, strictly speaking, it's no longer monadic second order logic. But instead, this mu will be used like this, where you say mu x xy means that x and y will be matched later on. So now <coughs> um, we need another layer because this mu occurs freely here. And what we do is we extensionally quantify it here. Then we have something from our first layer and we say that mu is matching, which means that it fulfills the three properties that you've seen before. And this matching formula can actually be um, defined in our logic in our first layer. And we abbreviate it like this. There exists a matching mu such that beta holds. Now we extend it to make it weighted. And for this, we need this omega valuation monoid. And in the paper, we actually use a product omega valuation monoid. Then you also have a product. But here for the talk, I guess it's easier to talk about um, the normal monoid that you've seen before. And then we have this here, which is not in the paper, but it works more or less similar. So what we have is we have some d, which is some weight. We can add something up, which is the addition of our monoid. And this here means that if beta from our first layer is true, then we have the weight of our first formula phi, and otherwise we have the second formula phi. <coughs> Sorry. Um, we have existential quantification, which will also be added up. And then we have this val x, and this means that um, for every possible position of x, which is infinitely many, you will have one formula phi, so you plug it in, then you get an infinite sequence of weights, and you feed it to the omega valuation function in our monoid. Okay, and then we extend also the last layer, we make a weighted matching logic, and um, here, if you look, this existential quantification will actually be replaced by a weighted existential quantification, and this intersection will be replaced by this um, question mark colon operator, or in the paper also by a product, which I omit here for the presentation. And then we have something like a weighted uh, existential quantification. There exists a matching mu such that phi holds. And I have a short example for you. This is the automaton that you've seen before. Now we can <coughs> we can say if at position x there's the symbol income, then you would apply the weight two. If there's recession, then it's zero, and otherwise it's minus. Uh, 
1000 and in the other case it's minus infinity which just means it's the neutral element of our semi-ring of our monoid. Now along a run that is possible we would apply the omega valuation function and in the end we would add up over all possible matchings. So there's multiple matchings possible here and because we have the supremum here it doesn't matter we can just take one of them but strictly speaking you could also uh, forbid certain matchings or you could say okay an empty matching should be used but I think it's uh, complicated enough for the example. So this is um, the idea and now we have the following result um, for an omega valuation monoid in the series the following are equivalent um, either s is recognized or s is recognizable if and only if um, there is an omega ml sentence so this is the weighted matching logic um, with, which defines exactly our series so this theorem works in two directions and um, <clears throat> I'm sorry that I cannot explain to you all notions that are used here. So I told you already that in the paper we extend our valuation monoid by a product. So this is used in the theorem, of course. Then um, this regularity property is used such that we don't, we exclude some, let's say, academic omega valuation monoids that can break our theorem because then the um, logic gets um, yeah let's say it can break stuff but that is why we restrict to regular monoids and at the same time we need to restrict our form um, our formulas even because um, also in the regular case unrestricted MSO is too hard in the weighted case, too strong in the weighted case. So here's a short proof over you. We have these simple automata in our logic and um, one direction of the proof works by, uh, works by the standard approach of most of the Cauchy theorems that I've read, where you write down a logical formula that defines exactly the behavior of our automata and um, yeah, this also works in this case. Now the other direction normally works by induction, but we can use a shortcut by reusing a result from Trost and Dück in 2017, who did the same for some similar logic without the last layer. And then if you don't have this mu variable quantified, then it means that, um, that mu is actually <coughs> unbounded and you have to give it into your word and then this one is actually a nested word. And we can reuse this result because they have a Bushi type re um, theorem for it already and then what is missing um, yeah, because we only have these two layers we have to come we have to extend it to the third layer and this is actually the last inductive step that is missing which is a projection from nested words two words and this one uses the Bushi Muller acceptance equivalence that we've seen already because their automaton model that they use uses Muller acceptance condition. And just a short outlook. Last year we showed that um, algebraic series can be translated into simple automata and the other direction is actually still open. So this is why our logic is unfortunately not, or well, I cannot say that it's for all omega algebraic series. A short summary, I showed you a Niva theorem, the equivalence of Bushi and Muller acceptance and our logic, which extends classical MSO um, matching logic for context-free languages. We use nested word automata in our proof and the simple push-down automata are quite essential and the idea is they don't use epsilon transitions and only push, pop, 
and internal transitions. Okay, I hope you can take something with you. Thank you for your attention.